I would now like to introduce you to my colleague, Guillermo Freire, EDC's Vice President of Structured and Project Finance and head of our clean tech team, will serve as a moderator for our next panel on how clean tech companies are approaching net zero targets. Guillermo, over to you. Thank you, Dan, for the introduction. As Dan said, my name is Guillermo Freire, and I am the Vice President of Structure and Project Finance here at EDC. I'm pleased to be the moderator for our first panel during the Cleantech Export Week on a topic that is very important to me and to, uh, important to many of us. Net Zero, it's in the minds of many, including the government of Canada and thousands of companies around the globe that are making Net Zero commitments. Net Zero is more than a pledge. It's a signal to Canadian companies of the challenges and opportunities that lie ahead. In this panel, we will hear from three great award-winning clean tech companies that are on the leading edge of this, of this transition to net zero here in Canada and abroad. These companies are demonstrating leadership and innovation in this space. I look forward to this conversation. So please join me in welcoming our three panelists, David Asano, co-founder and president of Efenco Development, Development Lori Gutt, vice president and head of business development at Carbon Engineering, and Robert Niven, founder, CEO, and chair at Carbon Cure Technologies. Thank you all for joining me today for this discussion. Maybe to begin our panel, I would like, to, I would like each of you to share us a little bit more about your company and what product or service do you sell? Robert, do you wanna start? I'd be happy to. Uh, thank you very much for having me here today. It's a pleasure to be here with EDC at this event. Uh, Carbon Cure is a carbon removal technology company which serves the concrete industry. We provide a portfolio of technologies which help concrete producers use carbon dioxide productively in their production process, which allows them to not only lower their carbon footprint, but also to lower their costs. Uh, we also sell the carbon removal credits, uh, which all corporates and some governments are making uh, net zero targets of which we've discussed today. Uh, so that net does require uh, purchasing of credits uh, and we would be one of the largest suppliers of these credits um, that are a permanent carbon removal product. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Laurie, over to you to tell us a little bit more about carbon engineering. Well, thanks so much, Guillermo, and thanks to EDC for the invitation to join you at Clean Tech Export Week. Carbon Engineering is a clean technology company headquartered in British Columbia, um, and we've developed a technology called direct air capture. And direct air capture is, as it sounds, you can think about it like a big vacuum cleaner sucking CO2 molecules out of the air. And when we were founded back in 2009 with some seed funding from Bill Gates, we were kind of a backup plan. Uh, the world had recognized that we have added too much carbon dioxide into the air and it was causing climate change. Um, but the world was focused on reducing emissions. We were hope still hoping at that point in time that we would reduce emissions fast enough that we could avoid uh, the, the most severe impacts of climate change. Fast forward to 2018, the IPCC uh, announced that we were really out of time. We needed to not only um, reduce our emissions everywhere we can, but we also needed to start removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere at significant volumes. Um, and the good news is by that point in time, uh, we had developed our technology. It was ready to deploy at commercial scale. Um, and that's what we're doing now uh, is deploying at commercial scale. And once you've captured the CO2 molecules from the air, you have to figure out how to put the molecules to work to make it economic to build out this clean infrastructure. And there are two primary ways that we do that. Um, we take the CO2 out of the air and we permanently and safely put it back underground where the carbon came from. Or we can take the carbon from the air and turn it into carbon products. And one of those products is liquid fuels like diesel and jet fuel. Another place that the CO2 can go is into concrete and, and other, other durable carbon products. Thank you, Laurie. Uh, last but not least, uh, David, you wanna to talk to us about Evenco? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Guillermo. Um, I'm uh, David Arsenault. I'm uh, one of the co-founders of uh, FNCO Development. Um, at FNCO, we do an uh, electric powertrain for heavy-duty trucks. Uh, we, uh, I created a company back in 2006, so it, it's been quite a while. Uh, we've been focusing on a special type of vehicle, so heavy-duty but vocational trucks. So we decided to uh, kind of specialize ourselves. Uh, we do sell uh, in, in 10 countries, uh, and we'll, you'll see probably in the news tomorrow, we're announcing a, a large order of about 60 units we had from, uh, from a, a private operator in France uh, who are uh, using our technology and their waste collection route to, uh, to offset or reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. So I'm happy to be here today. 
Thank you. Thank you. Laurie, maybe maybe next question we start with you. Uh, we have been hearing lots about net zero, uh, net zero commitment from governments, investors, financial institutions, and other key players in the financing space. From your perspective, what net zero, what does uh, that, uh, that, what opportunities that net zero provide to the clean tech sector here in Canada? Awesome. Yes, and we're seeing more and more net zero announcements in the lead up to COP26, which is really exciting. Um, so it's fantastic that the world companies, governments are announcing net zero plans or even passing net zero into law, which compels, a, of course, the country to have to do so. Um, in terms of opportunities for Canadian companies, uh, I think the really good news is that in the last few decades, Canada, Canadian um, federal and provincial governments and universities have really leaned in to try to incubate clean technology companies. And so we're actually punching above our weight in terms of the number of clean tech companies we have in Canada, which is fantastic as the world is becoming more aware of the problem and really leaning in to, to do something uh, about it. So exciting times. Um, I have a quote here from John Kerry, who's the US Special Presidential Envoy for Climate. Um, and he said, uh, there is a huge new market opening up I think it's very exciting and in my judgment, it's gonna be the biggest market we've seen in the world since the industrial revolution. Um, and he's also said about half of the emissions that we have to reduce are gonna be reduced by technologies that are not yet at scale in the market. So I think that really speaks to the, the opportunities that are out there and it's really exciting for Canada to, to be able to participate. Thank you, Laurie. And I think the comment you made about uh, Canada punching above uh, its waistline um, it, it is it is it is true. I'm happy to share a little bit of a start here, where you know 12 out of the top 100 companies, clean tech companies by the clean tech group, are Canadian, and I think the three of you are actually part of that uh, of that that list. So congratulations for that, uh, David. Anything you want to add uh, with respect to opportunities for for clean tech here in Canada? Yeah, well. Um... For sure, the Canadian market is a is, is a small market when compared to the entire world. So uh, we uh, we had to go and have some growth elsewhere. Uh, this being said, I think our product and the technology that we develop will benefit Canada. Uh, in my in my scope, uh, I'm trying to you know I always say that my biggest competitor is is status quo. So I'm trying to uh, to provide a solution for my customer to go towards net zero. Uh, so in, in my space, that will mean uh, converting into full electric transportation for, for vocational trucks. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, I'm providing my services. Well, my customers are providing essential services. So for them, it's really difficult to make that first step. So moving them away from status quo and having them to start moving that, that target, which is net zero, is really my goal that every day, my everyday goal. Uh, and uh, I think we're, we're, we're getting there. We're, uh, it's a little bit of help from government regulation but also uh, from companies objective of improving their ESG rating uh, and I could see especially in the past year uh, in this in this in the scope of the uh, COP26 also I can see companies moving Canadian company also are, are for sure uh, at the forefront of that. Thank you and, and Robert uh, what about you what could you tell us about the the opportunities that Net Zero provides to clean the companies in Canada? Well, I also just just wanted to add to the the rankings is that uh, carbon engineering is is actually the reigning North American clean tech company of the year, which is um, a very special award and recognition. And uh, Carbon Cure preceded them, and I'm sure that uh, Afinco will be this year's um, North American clean tech company of the year. My fingers are crossed. Um, so we're definitely punching way above our weight here. Uh, and uh, I think net zero, and, and in our case, uh, carbon removal, and that of carbon engineering. Uh, is a particularly hot area right now. Uh, we're seeing the financial sector really lean into this space with uh, enormous pools of investment and interest at all different asset classes. Um, we're also seeing financial institutions, including Canadians, playing a leading role in purchasing carbon rule credits. Um, so we're uh, pretty excited soon to be announcing the uh, our role in helping the first um, financial asset manager uh, go uh, carbon neutral. Uh, so some really exciting leadership being provided by the investment sector and Canadian companies are going to really benefit as recipients of investment, but also being part of the solution providers uh, as as companies and government shift to net zero. That's that's excellent, Robert. Thank you for that. Uh, David, back to you. So what is the difference between the Canadian market and other jurisdictions with regards to regulations or policy frameworks? Um, any, any any main difference that you you can uh, you you want to talk to us about? Yeah, well, um, 
having customers on both sides of the pond, I think it's, it's, it's a great way for us to compare the two markets. Uh, I will say that the approach in North America is more kind of a carrot where there's incentives and there's, a, there's a grants that are awarded to uh, companies who want to use clean technology and apply them to their, to their, uh, to their vehicles. Whereas in Europe, it's much more implemented, implemented in regulation. Uh, as a good example, uh, the customer I was referring to earlier, uh, out of which we received a large order uh, a few weeks ago, uh, is operating in France in the waste collection industry, and they uh, they apply with our technology directly at the bidding process, so at the bidding stage, because there are some points that are awarded to uh, greenhouse gas reduction in municipal bids, uh, whereas in North America, it's all, most often just on the lowest bidder. So by doing so, uh, they actually get a competitive edge uh, by including our technology in their initial bid, and they're they're willing to well, they're actually achieving growth, commercial growth, winning more and more bids, and taking you know market share with our technology. As opposed to in North America, it will be uh, the lowest bidder, but they can offset the cost of technologies with grants. But again, being in an essential service uh, space, they tend to focus on really the core of what they do, and it has, it, it doesn't have as as much as an impact. I will say that when it's implemented in, into regulation. Thanks, uh, thanks, David. Uh, Robert, what what difference do you see with respect to regulations here and and, and abroad? Well, I, I'm going to pick up on a few things that that David said just now. Uh, one of the most exciting things that I'm seeing in in uh, North America and other regions as well is uh, procurement. Uh, so green procurement rules that are being set by uh, private, but especially public. And we have a very similar situation to uh, Afinco in that uh, our customers who are concrete producers are including carbon cure in their bids as well for public procurement. So large infrastructure projects, highways or what have you, uh, but also private. So when they can be, uh, when they can receive market signals around green procurement that require you know reporting of what are the environmental impacts these are called epds and are making buying decisions based on those that's something that can have an enormous effect on scaling up these types of solutions but also bringing these new innovations out of the lab and into the market much sooner because they have that carrot uh, that of that market opportunity so I, I would say that this is probably the most important uh, policy uh, that I think is necessary and it fortunately is already starting to take shape in many jurisdictions, but in the North American context, it tends to be in the US. Uh, Canada is still very much playing a catch up, but also sees this as a potential trade barrier if we're not able to align our procurement policies with uh, buy clean or, or buy America policies that are requiring these kinds of considerations. So we, um, I, I think it's a very, very hot area that provides a tremendous amount of opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Laurie, anything you want to add to this? Sure, yeah. Um, in our world in direct air capture, the good news is that the size of the market, potential market is significant. So climate experts think that we might need to be removing 10 to 20 billion tons of carbon from the air by the time we get to 2050 to get to net zero. So enormous um, market, but being the new kid on the block in terms of the technology readiness, um, the place where we are most relevant is when uh, somebody's trying to figure out how to get all the way to net zero um, because it's hard to get all the way there um, and it's expensive. And so we provide a, a scalable, affordable solution to that. Um, or if you're trying to decarbonize transportation and, and you've done all of the good work to, to electrify and, and um, decarbonize what you can, but you have things like aviation or long haul trucking that still have the challenge of, of using fossil fuels. So how do you decarbonize those? So what we're seeing is that um, director capture based solutions either director capture and sequestration or a low carbon fuel are popping up in transportation policies. And there, um, the very first policy to make it economic for us to build out uh, was actually in California. So the California low carbon fuel standard, um, our fuels were eligible, but then California in 27, 2019 um, amended their policy to allow for simply the capture of a ton of atmospheric CO2 sequestered in the geosphere counts for a California LCFS credit. Since then, the Washington LCFS also includes director capture-based solutions. Uh, there are Canadian uh, provincial government um, 
policies that are looking in, and including that. And then, of course, we have the Canadian Clean Fuel Standard that recognizes um, carbon uh, uh, fuels made from carbon from the air as well. So we're seeing kind of a patchwork of different kinds of ways that our, our technology is appearing on the, on uh, in carbon policies, and we expect that uh, hopefully to proliferate now that the now that it's possible to do this work. Thanks, Laurie. So understanding, you know, the difference between regulations and, and jurisdictions, how do you decide uh, which markets to focus on when uh, when looking to expand your business internationally? Um, very much uh, who is leaning in and, and what kinds of carbon policies are there and are we are we eligible with our technology or if we work with the, the lawmakers um, to understand what's possible, will they include that? And, and uh, the good news for us is that um, carbon policies in Germany and, and the UK and elsewhere for fuels already are at a price point that makes it economic. Also, we see governments actually looking at directly procuring carbon removal um, as, as part of the offsetting of government emissions in Europe and in North America. Those are the two uh, primary jurisdictions where we're seeing the price on carbon high enough. Um, but again, it's, it's uh, moving across the world. Thank you, Laurie. Uh, what about Efenko, David? Uh, well, in our case, we uh, we were fortunate to really early on have a uh, have a customer that um, actually had a certain vision who took the initiative of uh, reducing greenhouse gas emission by their own will. So it's this the same customer, De Rigbo, who, who who made uh, some uh, wanted to could grow their business elsewhere. So their their head office is based in France, but they wanted to come to North America, so they came to to Montreal. So we were able to sell to them here, and it's really them open the door to export and to then go in Europe. So uh, they, they were bidding on a large order in the city of Paris and they asked us if we wanted to participate. And this is kind of how we went there. And this is how we learned of this different dynamic that existed in Europe. And then we grew, we kind of grew from there in different countries, uh, Netherlands, Italy, uh, Norway after that. Uh, but really, I will say that uh, we, uh, we decided, and this may be a, a little piece of advice for some people, we decided to go and make that jump to Europe once we already had a customer, which was a European customer that we had here in Canada. That's, uh, that's very interesting, David. Um, Robert, any, any tips or any, uh, any ideas of how do you make those decisions? Yeah, for, for us, the most important criteria is finding local partners. And, and we, we use uh, oftentimes a uh, a, a channel model to enter into new marketplaces. And, and we're now, we just entered our sixth continent and growing quickly on, on building out some of those new markets for us. And it really comes down to the program that we put around that partner and also the initial selection. Uh, mission alignment is a really, really important quality uh, that I'm always looking for in investors and, and partners and, and new staff for that matter is it's one that really allows all of us to be more successful, but partnerships are one that I would really like to add to this conversation as being critically important. Thank you, Robert. And, and it's interesting that you mentioned staffing. We're, we're going to be talking about that in, in, a, in a minute, but yeah, it's very interesting. So any any maybe perspective from, from any of the three of you with respect to emerging markets? You know, we, we talk about uh, Europe, we're talking about North America, any other markets that are, uh, that are up and rising in, in your views? I don't know, Robert, you want to start? Yeah, or go, go ahead, Robert. Oh. Yeah, I can speak after, yeah. I think this has probably been one of the more surprising uh, elements of, of our business is that we're seeing a lot of unsolicited and very highly qualified uh, sales opportunities in emerging markets, uh, which is actually really good news because uh, you know for us to be very successful in the US means that we solve 7% of the problem or access 7% of the market. It's uh, most concrete is being poured in emerging markets. That's where the population growth is occurring. And that's where we need to be for us to be able to meet our corporate mission of saving 500 million tons of CO2 annually by 2030. Uh, so seeing all of that like high quality demand coming out of emerging markets, like places like Southeast Asia, South America, uh, the Middle East region are examples I think that have really given us some uh, optimism. And we're seeing the scale up stages of technology occurring much faster there as well. Whereas in a Europe, it requires what seems like endless amounts of testing before you can really get going and or going through regulatory approvals in, in Europe, it requires some additional steps and that's fine. 
But in some of these emerging markets, you can go from zero to 100 almost overnight and, and uh, really have a significant impact. Thanks, uh, David. I didn't, did not mean to cut you off, so please. No, 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 no worries, uh, no worries. Uh, uh, in our case, uh, we, um, we, so we're present in waste collection, or, but also in ports, uh, and port operators uh, are very often having managing more than one port. Uh, so we have a customer, uh, uh, Dubai Port World, who have about 80 different ports that they <clears> operate. <throat> And by selling to them uh, in Vancouver allowed us to uh, discuss of pot potential opportunities in the Dominican Republic and also in Peru. Uh, we're, we're still growing. So it, it's, a big, uh, it's a big jump to go and support those markets. Uh, we sell our system, but we also have all of this after sales services that we need to provide. But I'm just saying that as Robert uh, is mentioning, it's, it's unsolicited uh, kind of opportunity that are coming up. Uh, not necessarily coming from regulation from Dominican Republic, but coming from large organization who have global objective they need to meet and they have different satellite business units uh, in those different markets. All right. Thanks. Thanks, David. Laurie, anything you want to add to this question? Yeah, maybe just echo what Rob and David said, um, just about the um, seems fast and furious, lots of opportunities coming uh, from all over the world and lots of new net zero targets from countries that hadn't previously set that are being announced in the last few months. Um, and I think one of the things that dri that's driving it as well is, is that we create lots of jobs. So um, for one of our projects, it's hundreds of steady state operations jobs in these countries are recognizing that uh, to decarbonize, um, they're going to need to lean in and make plans and, and procure solutions. But also they'd like to see that uh, economic development at home. And so they want to lean in earlier um, to see if they can create jobs as well. Thank you, Laurie. Uh, Laurie, Robert, a question for the two of you. Um, what opportunities are carbon removal credits and carbon pricing providing to your company? Maybe, maybe Robert, we start with you. I'd be happy to do that. So th this is a, a new and evolving space. And I think Laurie and I have both touched on elements of that is um, carbon removal credits are different than traditional carbon offsets, which most people are probably familiar with over the last 20 years, which is typically a matter of, of uh, reducing emissions which occur. Removal is actually, uh, you think of it like a way of reversing climate change, where you're actually able to use CO2 uh, from the atmosphere that could be captured from biology or machines like direct air capture, and uh, ideally put into a permanent storage. So that could be the geosphere or products like concrete um, uh, or, or other, lots of other products and, and commodities as well. Um, so this is a, a very rapidly evolving, uh, uh, highly evolving marketplace that I believe will be replacing traditional offsets. Uh, and, and that there's been a lot of concern about quality of the carbon offsets. And then we're gonna see these high quality carbon removal uh, market emerge to take its place. Uh, so we're seeing a lot of demand that tends to be focused on um, specific corporate buyers, many of them in the tech sector. I'm seeing financial institutions also leaning in. And as Laurie had mentioned to earlier, governments may be even play a role about direct purchasing of carbon removal uh, as a way of meeting their net zero targets. So very interesting. They tend to sell at a much higher price than traditional offsets, but that's because you're getting a lot more for them. Uh, and both Carbon Cure and, and Carbon Engineering, I don't want to speak for them, are, are selling into this marketplace uh, and participating in a lot of these early transactions as this market is starting to evolve. It's really, really, really important for companies like Carbon Cure because it provides an additional source of revenue for us to be able to scale up the technology, which we share with concrete producers. So it creates this incentive to deploy much faster because it creates another incentive structure. What it also does secondarily is gives our, our um, innovators in the lab more uh, urgency to push out these technologies into the world so that they can start participating in these carbon markets. So it's very important for those two elements. And I would say after procurement, as I mentioned earlier, this is the second most important scale up mechanism, which I think can help uh, really increase the, the size of this marketplace. Wow. Wow. That's super interesting. Robert, uh, Laurie, anything you want to add to this? Yeah, no, just echoing again what Robert said, um, voluntary markets uh, are are coming on fast. Um, with, a, with a project that removes a million tons of CO2 per year, we need to look to markets that are big enough. And so we've been focused on regulated markets like the California LCFS, that's a 30 megaton market. 
Um, but what's been happening is, is uh, as Robert said, um, you know, companies are, are leaning in and saying, we want to take action on climate, we want to do something now, we essentially want to, we want to help kickstart those technological solutions that will help us decarbonize. Um, and we want to include that in our sustainability plan today, um, maybe in addition to buying um, offsets as they've traditionally done, or in some cases, some of the tech companies are shifting 100% across to spending their sustainability budgets on kickstarting the, the solutions that they see will be scalable and affordable uh, to help solve climate change, which is incredibly exciting. Uh, for us, we, we aggregate that voluntary market demand with regulated market demand, and we will build out this clean infrastructure as fast as markets pull. So it's really uh, fun to see that happen. I'll, Thanks, I'll, I'll, I'll just make one added point there is like, there's a lot of innovation occurring on the technology side, but on the buyer side, I, I think we'd be remiss not to mention um, companies like Shopify, which are a great Canadian um, corporate success story, which are really one of those few companies leading the charge on the buyer side that are making all of this marketplace start to come together. So there's a, several others that are in this area, but I think uh, Shopify as a Canadian example would be um, certainly something that we should we should illuminate. Definitely, Robert. Uh, Robert. Uh, we actually had Shopify as a panelist also in, in a similar discussion earlier in the year uh, where, where they, they shared with us their, their story. Mm -hmm. uh, David, so you, you're not in the business of uh, carbon capture or carbon removal, but uh, you're in the business of uh, emissions reductions. Any, any opportunities that carbon removal credits or carbon pricing provides to your company? Well, uh, they're, they're based on, on uh, right now uh, on, on fuel producer. So we're uh, kind of on the uh, vehicle side. Uh, on the vehicle side, there are some credits that are not directly linked to carbon, but are, that are linked to uh, improving efficiency of, of vehicles. And these credits are awarded to a, a large OEM. Uh, so Canada has the same regulation as in the US where they try to provide a um, a path towards uh, average CO2 emission of vehicles. So it's vehicle based and per vehicle year. Uh, and so we have like large OEM like Mack Truck, which is a division of Volvo, uh, who like to implement our technology within their product on a new vehicle, which gives them access to this, uh, well, lowering their average, if you want, in terms of, of reducing or average fleet emission uh, per, per vehicle uh, type. So this is more the dynamic that I have in my space uh, where, where we've seen that. Uh, for sure, there's going to be a, a combination, you know, there's no, in transportation, it's really a challenge. Uh, we try to focus in our, in our niche, uh, which is a fairly large niche of about 200, uh, 2 million vehicles per year, but still in the global theme of, of transportation, that, that's pretty small. Different uh, duty cycle, I, I think I've already mentioned, uh, like a uh, long haul uh, semi truck will, are completely different than what we're doing, which is short distances, a lot of stop and go but also we do 24 hour a day. So that brings kind of extra challenges. So there, there are different kinds of technologies that are that will emerge and that will fit different kinds of duty cycle. Uh, we have a lot of data that we rely on to guide us into what's the, the best application. But if I can just say in general, we still try to go towards a solution that is cost effective. So yes, my over the past three years, I will say the main driver, the main market driver for me has become greenhouse gas reduction. Uh, before they were trying to, to look at payback, now they're comparing other greenhouse gas reduction technology and then the cost per ton, and then they're, we're, we're being judged based on that, not necessarily based on payback. But this being said, uh, I think the key, uh, the key way to accelerate the penetration is still to reduce cost of, of these every ton that you have set. Uh, and this is why we're trying to do uh, in our space. And the only way, from my opinion, to do it in a cost effective way to specialize yourself. So this is why we're, we're being specialized in what we do. Thank you, David. Um, Robert, can you give us an example of what's driving your buyers? It's, it's uh, cost savings, uh, reduction in energy use, reduction in carbon intensity of their goods and services, or, me, or meeting regulatory requirements. Like what, what's, what, what is mainly driving the, uh, the demand for your product? Well, I, I think a, a lot of what David had said there at the end resonated. And you know, the concrete industry is a commodity industry, very low margin, hard scrabble. It's uh, you got to fight every day to, to make a buck and uh, Carbon Cure uh, was able to uh, to enter into this marketplace by providing those those economic benefits, uh, which 
was certainly the most important element as we got started and will continue to be. However, like uh, David had mentioned, is we are seeing carbon performance becoming more and more important. Uh, ways that we've been able to help create more value uh, that hits the concrete producer customer's bottom line is by using things like carbon removal credits, uh, but also harnessing a lot of the data that we're able to uh, collect and then use to operate our system is that this can also be used to provide concrete producers with new ways that they can run more efficient plants, uh, more optimized products, and also to connect more easily with their customers. Um, so there's always new ways that we're working on, whether it be hardware or digital or new business models like credits. But at the end of the day, we need to save concrete producers uh, money uh, because they don't have the luxury to just focus on reducing CO2 because it's such a competitive low margin business, but it's huge. Hmm. Laurie, what's driving your buyers? Many different things. So we sort of have a governments and uh, companies like airlines and then um, tech companies as, as customers. So if we just sort of talk, talk about what's motivating those three, um, in, in the case of governments, if they pass net zero into law, uh, as I mentioned earlier, they have a hard time getting all the way to net zero. So Director Capture can bring a, a scalable, affordable solution to them to get all the way to net zero and, and to do so for lower cost than it would have otherwise been. Um, in the case of companies like airlines, they're looking for those scalable, affordable solutions. They've tapped into biojet fuel and other, other resources to try to help decarbonize aviation, but those have scalability limits um, and they're expensive. And so airlines are wanting to be responsive to their customers who want to see the decarbonization of aviation. So both a director capture carbon removal and a low carbon sustainable aviation fuel are of interest to them. And then the tech and other companies like Shopify, and thanks Robert for the shout out to Shopify. They've been fantastic, really a uh, great Canadian story and great um, in terms of the climate team leaning in. Um, you know, they're, they're wanting to, um, they're responding to their customers and their employees and, and their investors who are asking for, for ESG reasons uh, for them to take action. And so they're wanting to lean in and help showcase and raise awareness about um, climate solutions and show that they're taking action. So a whole mix of reasons why people are coming to us, um, but, but all really fantastic. Thanks, Laurie. Baby, turning over to you, um, access to capital and, ta and talent are crucial for allowing business to grow internationally. How would you describe access to growth capital and talent here in Canada right now? Well, as, as Robert mentioned, uh, there's a lot of uh, companies that are created in Canada. I think the, uh, the R&D tax credit uh, benefits that we have is one reason for that, the uh, lower cost of living and also great, great universities. So I think it, from, uh, from a startup standpoint, it's, it's, it's kind of accessible. There are some great programs also like DTC, which we participated in. I know Robert, you did also. Um, the uh, challenge is when you get to a, to a growth or you, you try to get to that, you know, from that startup transition to a growth, uh, which we were able to do uh, with the help of, uh, of BDC and uh, Investissement Quebec, IQ area local in, in Quebec. Uh, that is great, uh, but what we're still kind of missing in my space, which is e-mobility in a way, uh, focusing on heavy duty, is, is, uh, is expertise in terms of uh, putting valuation on deals. So I think there's, there's plenty of money available. There's large institutional funds and, and, and private uh, pension funds in Canada. It's more the, uh, I will say, the, the, the level of knowledge uh, on a very specialized market, which we, we have to go elsewhere. We have to go into the US or in Europe to get that, that uh, sector specialist who's gonna actually price the round. Uh, and then we can leverage all sort of other investment uh, locally. But I will say that uh, being in a, in a, in a, at the forefront of the technology, it's, it's difficult for, for Canadian funds to go and have that expert, you know, within their, their staff and being able to really understand the market dynamic. We have to go elsewhere to get that, that special expertise. Thank you, David. Um, Robert, anything you want to add on this one? It's certainly becoming a lot more uh, competitive uh, for investors to place capital in good companies. And uh, I think what, what we're seeing as well is that funds that provide a lot more value add. So whether that be some of the items that David had mentioned uh, or influence in the market or within government policy development, uh, those are all things that are factored into decisions that uh, 
that companies or CEOs like myself are, are evaluating. Um, you know, certainly we're proud and have some fantastic Canadian investors and are continuing to add new Canadian investors. But I think that there is also um, uh, also some risk and 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 um, concentrating all of your capital from one market like like Canada. So we we try very actively to pull capital out of markets where we're not in necessarily in today, but where we want to be. Uh, so Southeast Asia, Europe. Um, Breakthrough Energy Ventures, for instance, has has uh, access and influence all the way around the world. Um, that's really, really helpful and provides some diversity and perspective or local on the ground knowledge that can be really key when trying to enter into new markets. And I lean heavily on those investors when we're trying to um, to accomplish new market entry or need some really specialized feedback and knowledge like if it's carbon removal markets i would turn to carbon direct for instance which are investors that are specializing in the space um so I, I i wouldn't say that the goal is to only have canadian investors but to really try to diversify thanks uh laurie what about carbon engineering so in terms of uh capital i would say um there's quite a lot of capital out there um investors that have invested in, in infrastructure projects over the past years and they're looking to uh, new clean tech infrastructure uh, for their investments but um the, the we're in the middle of the fun part right now which is as we scale up um how do we work with uh, you know project finance experts to manage the risk of the final step up and scale the technology retarding technology risk um, as well as uh, combining that with nascent carbon markets. And so, so we're in the middle of the fun part is, is uh, deploying the first uh, few projects at full scale, um, and then it will become a little bit more mainstream. In terms of talent, um, we've, we've uh, attracted lots of talent across, across Canada. Um, our EPC firm is actually based in Montreal, and we're, we're based in British Columbia. We've, we've brought in talent from Alberta. Um, but the, the talent that we need to build these infrastructure projects is actually um, in, in many ways going to come from the energy companies that have pulled fossil fuels out of the ground. Now we need, need to build the clean infrastructure to put carbon back underground. Um, so we, we see lots of uh, global um, skill set that, that we'll tap into that will um, will really make use of, of uh, energy company talent that's out there. And, and we're a technology licensing company. So we actually um, incubate our core technology and we license it to partners around the world, like 1.5 in the US and, and Storiga across in the UK who build it out. So they, they also then tap into that um, energy industry talent. Thank you, Laurie. Um, I think we have uh, a little more time, one, maybe for one more question from me and then uh, maybe a question or two from the audience. Um, so maybe I, I was hoping today that you can uh, each provide a piece of advice uh, for Canadian clean tech companies who are looking to grow internationally. So if you have kind of your 30 seconds elevator pitch, what, what, will, you, what will you tell them? David, maybe we'll start with you. Yeah, well, I, I've already a bit indicated uh, what that advice will be. Um, to me, they, uh, they, they, the way to successfully go to Europe was really to find a, an international company locally. So by, by finding that, that French company uh, that was doing business and doing business with them locally in Canada was, uh, really allowed me to jump. Uh, I think it's, it's much better to understand the environment and also uh, to have an experience of, of payments you know, with the company uh, before you just go and uh, try to uh, sell in a, a new continent or, or having that. Uh, so that's, a, that's one way of doing it that was really successful for us. So I uh, just want to share that with, uh, with the other uh, people. Thank you, David. Robert, what about you? I, I had mentioned the role of partners earlier. I, I think that's really key. Uh, to add another element, I would say definitely uh, spend time in market and just just relying on on your partner to represent you is not necessarily a winning formula. And I, I think that you learn a lot and may also find that there's some good opportunities to improve by adapting your business model or technology. So that 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 would apply to the you know the CEO or key other members of the leadership team. And, and so on is, is to, to get into market and really understand how you need to adapt. So there's probably little nuances at the very least that will help you become a lot more successful. Thank you. And you develop the relationships, which are really key because there's always bumps on the road. Uh, so if you spend that time, you're able to pick up that call and have a discussion. Thanks, Robert. Laurie, what about you? 
I would say if you're a Canadian clean tech company looking to go global, then make sure you um, uh, leverage the Canadian government resources. Canada has some fantastic resources through EDC and our trade commissioner service to help you reach out and, and connect with um, global governments as well as uh, global companies. So make sure you tap into that. Um, I would say just echoing something that Robert and David have said, um, I think the fog is clearing on, on uh, solutions and, and through the science-based targets initiative, um, as well as others, really um, make sure that you've understood the science-based basis for the climate benefit that you're bringing with your new technology, and then look at markets where it's going to be economic. Don't worry if the carbon policies are still developing, which they are in many places. Um, if you're bringing something that's actually salt, providing a climate solution um, in a way that's going to be economic and affordable. We need an all of the above approach. So, uh, so um, you know, keep developing your technology, uh, work with policy setters, lawmakers around the world to help them understand your technology so that they can include it in those uh, carbon policies, but then, uh, but then lean in. Thank you. Thank you to the three of you. Those, that, those were very, uh, very good pieces of advice. I hope our audience were pen and paper taking, taking note of that. Um, I think we have time for one question from, from the audience. Um, so I'll, I'll just read it out loud here. Um, so we have a little under eight years to make a significant change in behavior to reach our 2030 goals. What one thing do panelists think uh, needs to happen to accelerate adoption of clean tech? Um, David, maybe we'll start with you. Well, in, in our case, uh, you know, I'm just speaking from experience, uh, what had the most impact was really uh, including, uh, you know, uh, Private, the private sector are, are okay. My customer that operate in the private sector uh, are really okay if there's an increase in regulation, as long as it's fair for everybody. You know, they've, they've been complying. Complying with regulation is, is essentially what they do for a living. So for them, it's okay. Just they, it's not their responsibility to, to drive those initiatives. They are sometimes with ESG rating that they try to improve, but ultimately regulation is really the key. And I'm, I'm seeing really that in the difference of of bids that are awarded in, in Europe as opposed to North America, where there, there's a direct impact. Thank you. Lori? I would say, um, you know, we, we hear from people across the world. People really want to help and they're aware of the urgency. And so our job is actually to make it easy to decarbonize with our, with our technology. We have to not just develop the technology, but then get it implemented so that people can actually access affordable solutions to decarbonize. But people are willing to pay a little bit more to, to get to net zero. Uh, we just have to put it all together so that it makes it easy for them to purchase. Thanks, Lori. Robert, last but not least. I'm going to double tap on the government green procurement. Uh, I think that that is such an important tool. In our case of concrete, uh, government typically purchases 40% of all concrete in any given market. So as the single largest buyer, and one that also has set their own net zero targets typically, is if they couple those two together, of actually making informed decisions on their procurement using high quality, transparent, environmental impact reporting uh, documents is that that can drive the entire market. And uh, it also delivers results and oftentimes does not require green premium. You just need to create the market signal. Uh, the same would apply to carbon removal credits if, if uh, purchasing those credits is also a key element. So procurement, procurement, procurement. Thank you, Robert. Um, so that's all the time we have for, uh, for you today. Uh, I want to thank Laurie, uh, David, and Robert for your participation and sharing, sharing your insights. Uh, this was a very interesting conversation, so thanks so much for that. I also want to thank the audience for being with us today. And, and I will also want to encourage everyone uh, to check out on the, on the networking sessions that are following, uh, following this panel. So thank you very much, and hopefully uh, we can see each other again soon. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Cheers. Bye.